Welcome to OIT for you. This broadcast is about preeclampsia. Thanks, Maureen. I'm impressed that you do both OB and GYN because a lot of people who enter the specialty seem to have migrated either to obstetrics or gynecology. That is true, and I am fortunate that I get to take care of women during pregnancy as well as when they're not pregnant. So this task force recommendation, I, I think since I've been doing the podcast, this is the one with the longest lag time between being updated. This is an actual update from a 1996 task force recommendation on screening for preeclampsia. That is correct. The last time the task force did a full review on this topic was in 1996. And we have considered it over the years and decided to update the recommendation at this time based on a review of new evidence as well as a change in the overall definition of preeclampsia. So why don't we start first with what the actual recommendation is, and we will come back to that a number of times. And then if you could explain the change in the definition, because... I think people recognize when definitions change, then issues around screening and case finding change. So firstly, what is the recommendation of the task force? The overarching recommendation is that the task force recommends screening for preeclampsia in pregnant women with blood pressure measurements throughout pregnancy. And this is a B recommendation from the task force. And I know in general, when women are pregnant, they do see individuals who are caring for them during the pregnancy at regular intervals. Does the task force make any specific recommendations about how often blood pressure should be measured? The recommendation recognizes that there may be different situations for each pregnant woman. And the recommendation is really about for every clinical encounter with a physician or their provider that they have a blood pressure measurement done during that visit. So no specific recommendation about the timing of when the blood pressure measurement should be made? There's no timing interval specific, but it should be done with each visit with their doctor. So the old definition of preeclampsia versus the new definition. How did it change and who changed it? The revised definition for preeclampsia is that you have high blood pressure during pregnancy with protein in your urine. In the case where you don't have protein in your urine, but you may have other conditions that have evidence of damage to other organs like the liver or the kidneys, that could put you in the category of preeclampsia. And because of the change in definition, it sounds as though the task force thought this was a good time to update the 1996 recommendation regarding screening. That's correct. How common is preeclampsia and what are the consequences both for the mother and the infant? Preeclampsia can impact somewhere in the range of 4 to 5 percent of all pregnancies. That's a pretty high proportion of pregnancies impacted. And it can have outcomes that are associated with the moms and the babies. For moms, there can lead to, as I mentioned, in terms of organs can be damaged, liver, kidneys, but also can lead to seizures during pregnancy. That's actually called eclampsia. For the baby, the outcomes can be associated with babies that don't grow well in the uterus, or they might have something called an abruption where the placenta can separate from the uterus, as well as being low birth weight and other complications of pregnancy. There's approximately 4 million births each year. So with an occurrence rate of about 4%, that means somewhere between 150 and 200,000 women who are pregnant each year will be diagnosed with preeclampsia. Is it something that most obstetricians will see during uh, their year of practice? I would say yes. This is something that all obstetricians would have this as part of their awareness in their practice and would be screening for at each clinical visit. And if they ultimately meet the revised criteria, and I note them 
in the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force recommendation statement as including elevated blood pressure greater than or equal to 140 over 90 milligrams of mercury on two occasions, four hours apart after 20 weeks gestation, and either protein urea greater than or equal to 300 milligrams per deciliter on a 24-hour urine protein test or a protein to creatinine ratio of greater than or equal to 0.3 milligrams per millimold or a urine protein dipstick reading greater than one if quantitative analysis is not available. If women meet those criteria, what's the next step for the person providing care for this woman? Treatment for preeclampsia is more intensive monitoring for the mother and for the fetus and the growing baby. And that would often be either in the hospital or, depending on the setting, was most often done in the hospital to confirm a diagnosis and to evaluate how the mother and the baby are doing. They could also have, depending on the level of blood pressure, they may need to have the blood pressure treated with an antihypertensive or may need to have magnesium treatment to help minimize poor outcomes. It really depends on how many weeks pregnant the woman is and what the situation is. And are there any high-risk groups for preeclampsia? There are women who are at higher risk for developing preeclampsia, and those include women who've had preeclampsia in a prior pregnancy, those who've had outcomes in a previous pregnancy that might include a a baby who didn't grow well in, in the uterus, It also includes women who have other types of medical problems, such as diabetes that predated pregnancy or if they've had kidney problems or have high blood pressure in starting pregnancy. There are other high-risk conditions as well that might include women who are overweight or who have more than one fetus growing. So those who have twins or triplets are at higher risk for developing preeclampsia as well. So is the approach to the woman who is high risk, is it any different than the approach to the woman who is not high risk? The women who have, who might be high risk may be being seen at different intervals during their pregnancy with their doctor. The recommendation is that they are screened at every prenatal visit with their doctor. In women who are identified in the first trimester, which is before 12 weeks of pregnancy, If they're identified as high risk, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force has a recommendation for using low-dose aspirin or baby aspirin as a preventive medication after 12 weeks of gestation in women who are identified in that high-risk category. Thank you. I do appreciate you making that point, Maureen, because oftentimes the task force has related recommendations around a particular group that they're considering. And the use of aspirin after 12 weeks, what's the indication in terms of what it's supposed to help with with respect to prevention? Is it preeclampsia? Yes. That recommendation is specifically around decreasing the risk of developing preeclampsia. So, yes, that is a very specific recommendation for preeclampsia. Now, moving on to the diagnostic tests, I think most people are are generally comfortable with blood pressure and how blood pressure should be measured. And I know the task force has a nice description of that. But in addition to blood pressure measurement, they also considered a number of other tests. The first that I was hoping to discuss is urine tests for detecting protein and then the sensitivity of the protein to creatinine ratio. Could you just talk about those two diagnostic tests? Sure. And I'd like to just clarify that the task force evaluated protein urea or urine in the protein as part of the screening test for preeclampsia. And this specific recommendation is about screening for preeclampsia, and the recommendation is for blood pressure measurement. What we're talking about right now is that measuring protein in the urine is used to confirm the diagnosis or part of the diagnostic criteria. So I just want to make sure that we're clear on that as we move forward. And the task force did look at the accuracy of testing for proteinuria 
And we looked at dipstick testing as well as what you refer to as a protein creatinine ratio. And what we found was that the dipstick testing was we did we, we had some studies that we were able to evaluate, but did not find that those tests were accurate for predicting the outcomes of preeclampsia. And similarly, for the protein creatinine ratio, um, we looked at the sensitivity um, and specificity for that test as well and found that we didn't have a robust test for accuracy in predicting the outcome of preeclampsia. So this is about, we looked at the screening test of using the urine protein dip stick and the protein creatinine ratio. I believe the task force also identified 16 multivariable risk prediction models that were evaluated in four external validation studies, but they didn't find much encouraging results around these risk prediction models. Can you just comment on this issue? Sure. The task force was interested in seeing if there were risk prediction models that could help in identifying women who are at high risk for developing preeclampsia. However, the evaluation and the evidence, what we found was that these had low positive predictive values and were not able to be recommended for use as a predictive tool in our assessment for preeclampsia. The other piece of looking at these predictive models where they weren't based on information that you could get during a routine visit with your obstetrician. And which would mean we would like to be able to have a tool, a predictive model, where you could use clinical information, whether it's the patient history or some type of clinical information you gather during the visit to be able to help predict whether uh, a woman is at higher risk for developing preeclampsia. We just don't have that yet. Yeah, the latter point that you make, Maureen, is so important. At JAMA, we often see papers that have a very complicated risk prediction models. And sometimes I think you'd need IBM Watson to help you figure out whether the risk prediction model is working or if you had all the variables to feed into it. And so I think we can often create very complicated risk prediction models, but I'm not certain they're often very practical or they do much better than more simple prediction rules. Now, the task force is excellent at considering harms of screening and treatment. Um, Any harms of screening and treatment with respect to preeclampsia? There are very few harms associated with blood pressure measurements. So the task force found that there was no evidence of harms with measuring blood pressure. The harms are really much more associated with the treatments of preeclampsia However, those are balanced in that the treatment of preeclampsia actually is the treatment of the disease, which has very significant outcomes, significant poor outcomes. And in the balance, the benefits of treating, identifying and treating preeclampsia outweigh those harms. And um, let's comment on the recommendations of other groups, because there's a number of societies that have commented on screening for preeclampsia. And I know the task force is always very good about considering those recommendations and highlighting where there's common ground and where there might be differences. The task force and the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists both recommend taking a blood pressure measurement at every clinical visit and we both agree that preeclampsia is a very serious condition. American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists also acknowledged that uh, taking a detailed medical history along with the routine blood pressure measurement are the best tools for alerting a clinician to a patient's potential risk. So that's an important group that the task force is aligned with to help prevent these very serious outcomes for both moms and babies. Thank you. So let's return to the discussion that we've already had because it is complicated, and that's the use of blood pressure, which is a B recommendation, and I'll state it according to the task force. The U.S. Preventive Services Task Force recommends screening for preeclampsia 
in pregnant women with blood pressure measurements throughout pregnancy, and it's a B recommendation. So could you once again explain, differentiate between the use of blood pressure as a screening tool and then the accuracy of the two diagnostic tests that the task force created, which was the detection, urine test in detecting proteinuria, as well as the sensitivity of the protein to creatinine ratio. So in the evidence review, it is clear that evaluating women with blood pressure measurements uh, throughout pregnancy can identify women with high blood pressure and will then lead to potential for diagnosing a woman with preeclampsia. The evidence around treating women who are identified with preeclampsia is very strong that the treatment improves outcomes for moms and babies. So that's really the crux of this recommendation about assessing women at each prenatal visit with blood pressure measurement to screen for preeclampsia. The role of evaluating protein in the urine for women is part of the diagnostic criteria for preeclampsia. It's not necessarily part of the screening criteria. And that, as we evaluated that in the task force, we did not find that there was accuracy in the measurement of protein in the urine for screening for preeclampsia. There is a significant role for evaluating protein in the urine in a woman who has high blood pressure to actually make the diagnosis of preeclampsia. That was perfect, Maureen. So I'll reread the definition that the task force gives for preeclampsia because I do think that will be helpful. Revised criteria diagnosis of preeclampsia include elevated blood pressure greater than or equal to 240 over 90 millimeters of mercury on two occasions four hours apart after 20 weeks of gestation, and either proteinuria greater than or equal to 300 milligrams per deciliter on a 24-hour urine protein test, protein to creatinine ratio of greater than or equal to 0.3 milligrams per millimoles, or urine protein dipstick reading if quantitative analysis is not available. And then, as you mentioned before, in the absence of proteinuria, thrombocytopenia, renal insufficiency, impaired liver function, pulmonary edema, or cerebral or visual symptoms. So uh, the evaluation of urine uh, is not helpful for screening, but it is important in the diagnostic evaluation of people at risk for preeclampsia. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Now, anything I didn't ask that I should have or anything that you think our listeners should know that we haven't discussed? Well, I'd like to comment that the task force is committed to improving the health of all women and their children. And this specific recommendation is about a very serious potential complication of pregnancy and that we can screen for preeclampsia during pregnancy so that we can treat women and improve the health of both the moms and babies. And I want to reinforce that this recommendation is that all pregnant women are screened for preeclampsia with blood pressure measurement at every visit during pregnancy. Thank you. Once again, it's been... System. Thanks, Maureen. I'm impressed that you do both OB and GYN because a lot of people who enter the specialty seem to have migrated...